take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Sports science, strength and conditioning, high performance coaching. Welcome to the Decoding Excellence Show. Today's episode of the Decoding Excellence Show is brought to you by the Central Virginia Sports Performance Community. If you haven't checked out cvasps.com forward slash community, I highly suggest you do it. I've logged onto the website and accessed some of the greatest materials when it comes to continuing education. You have presenters that come on and do guest lectures in addition to having access to what is otherwise the CVASP seminar uh, and the last six years of seminars. And uh, let me tell you, me and my performance staff have been going through some of them, some of them that we missed, and it is top-notch material. So I'd highly suggest, oh my goodness, I can't even speak today. I highly suggest that you check out the community. Jay has put together a tremendous amount of continuing education resources with community contributors like Dr. Brian Mann, uh, Nate Brookerson, Ryan Horn, Devin McConnell, Landon Evans, and, uh, and myself. It's a great resource if you're looking for a new continuing education domain. Check it out at cvasps.com. Hey everybody, welcome to this week's Decoding Excellence show, mini episode, where we are turning the microphone around. And rather than inviting a guest on to talk about what their specialty is, I'm going to turn the microphone around and, and maybe have a little bit of a monologue and ask myself many of the same questions that I love to ask the guests on the show. So today will be a day of reflection, maybe some introspection. But I think it's a great exercise to be willing to answer the same questions that you're often asking other audience or guests. So today is another great episode. It will be a shorter episode, so bear with it. Another 20 to 30 minute mini episode. And I am incredibly excited about bringing it to you guys. I know that there will be a lot of wisdom and a lot of things that you guys can pick up from this episode. So Without further ado, here is this week's mini episode. Hey everybody, this is Adam Ringler, the host of the Decoding Excellence Show. And thanks so much for tuning in for another week's installment of what is otherwise a mini episode, uh, an experiment where I am turning the microphone around and either sharing little bits of wisdoms from what I've learned from the different guests that have come on our show, maybe some of the things I'm experimenting with, what I'm thinking throughout my day, throughout my week, and maybe some of the books and resources that I've been exploring over the last couple weeks. But today's mini episode is a bit different. So I'm really excited for this week's episode because what I'm going to do is turn the microphone around and ask myself, Many of the questions that I love to ask the guests who come on and star in the Decoding Excellence show. So I I thought this might make uh, a great sort of distraction away from our typical uh, scheduling and our typical interview fashion. And this is essentially the, the premise of what was last week's episode as well. So I'm excited to do it. And, uh, and let's, let's get into some of the questions. So. The first question that I often ask my audience members and the guests that come on to our show is, how do you mentally prepare every day before you come into work to do your best work? And for me, that really depends, right? So my day as of lately, just during this transitional period, has started sort of chaotically every morning, right? It's a little bit different. It's unpredictable. And that is just based on the logistics of what is otherwise the schedule that we have. But some of the things that I like to do, especially in my morning, you know, like if you're familiar with collegiate strength conditioning, you often know that you will wake up uh, way earlier than maybe your family. If you are maybe like an introvert like myself, right? Like you might actually enjoy 
that moment of quiet time before the hustle and the bustle of things get going. And that's that's certainly myself. Um, and that's sort of the the domain that I would put myself in as well. So one of the couple things that that I do, obviously I wake up. If you want to really know the nuances of my morning, which I'm sure you don't, but let's uh, let's explore it just so we maybe tease out some of the habits and and the similarities between my day and your day or, or other high performance coaches out there. But I typically start with, uh, I wake up, I brush my teeth, I get the coffee going or tea some mornings and big fan of green tea or matcha. And uh, probably over the last five years, really have gone down a rabbit hole of exploring different yerba mates, which is a, a, another sort of caffeinated beverage, super caffeinated beverage, one that I really like with a little lemon in it. However, I get that going, and then as that's either percolating or as water's heating up or while the tea is steeping, don't don't kill me, guys, especially if you're the hard, hardcore tea fanatics for maybe over uh, steeping my teas. But while that's going, what I really like to try to do is pop into a Headspace application on my phone, which is a maker of a guided meditation app. I talked a little bit about it. On the last show, there's there's many different alternatives, whether it's Headspace or Calm. And uh, Kevin Rose, a Silicon Valley entrepreneur, is also coming out with a new app, also guided meditation, I think, TM app called Oak. So be on the lookout for that. I'm sure that's hitting uh, Apple devices here soon. However, I try to go through a take 10 or a 10-minute meditation, essentially a priming exercise through my morning where... I go through, try to focus on my breathing. I focus sort of on a body scan. I'm searching through my body where there might be tension. I try to come back to my breath. I try to just literally sit there and focus on just my breathing, which is challenging to do in the morning. Why? Because if you're a type A personality like myself, you wake up and you probably think of the hundreds of things that you need to do, want to do, have to get done before your morning starts. So that has been something that I've been exploring over the last four or five years of really trying to stay consistent with some guided meditation throughout my morning. And and let me tell you, especially with a four and a two-year-old at home, the opportunity, the mindfulness training, if you will, from that meditation uh, exercise or practice has a lot of carryover. And I think Andy in Headspace does a tremendous job of really sort of dedicating that session and focusing on the benefits, not only for yourself, but for the people that are around you, your family, your coworkers, the people that you service throughout your day. And I found a lot of similarities between other coaches. When I start to talk about mindfulness training or meditation or visualization, I'm surprised by the number of other coaches that also engage in a very similar practice. And that really starts my morning off on the right note. So After 10 to 15 minutes of guided meditation, that's the time that I usually, at this point in time, sit, drink some coffee. I might listen to a podcast while I'm getting ready for work. And then I jump in uh, a vehicle and I drive off and commute into, into work. But that morning routine has been consistent probably for me over the last eight, nine years or so. Um, maybe the added benefit of doing a little bit more mindfulness training the last couple years, but That has been something that's been really, really positive for me. I know if you're a student athlete listening to this and we we preach about having three square meals and three snacks and and continuously feeding, although for me, I end up doing a lot of intermittent fasting, but my morning is just purely either coffee with a little bit of heavy cream or it might be a a water-based tea, uh, no cream, anything like that. And then I'll usually have like a meal later in the day, right? It might be after a workout. It might be after a conditioning workout. And that has worked uh, for me for a while. And uh, and it seems seems to be going pretty well. And that's the way that I find myself preparing myself mentally throughout the day, um, or at least for the beginning of the day. And uh, those are sort of the consistent patterns and routines that I often have. So another question I love to ask my guests is, how has a failure or maybe an apparent failure set you up for later success in life? And if if you're human, you're going to come across some failures somewhere in your life. And I think the, the biggest thing for me 
uh, is two points of, uh, of critical failures in my life that really set me down what is otherwise this path into strength and conditioning. And, and one of which I spoke on a different podcast about, but it was uh, the realization that I was just not a good enough wrestler to continue uh, on the collegiate pathway in what is otherwise Big Ten, which is, uh, I think, still the powerhouse conference when it comes to wrestling. Uh, I quickly, as a young, naive 18-year-old arriving at Michigan State University, thinking that I was talented enough to be on the wrestling team, uh, quickly found out that I was otherwise, a uh, at least locally or regionally back where I came from, uh, a really big fish in a small pond and being surrounded by other incredibly talented wrestlers and, and athletes, I quickly found myself uh, at the very bottom of the list. And it was very humbling for me uh, twofold, right? Because all of my life, I was an athlete. I uh, was preparing for this pathway of, of, uh, of continued wrestling through high school and through freestyle and Greco-Roman and up to college. And then suddenly that loss of identity when I was no longer a, co a college wrestler as that hit. And that was uh, that was a huge sort of failure for me. And uh, it, it honestly shook me quite a bit. You know, I, I wrestled with sort of who I was as a person at that time, like any pro probably 18 or 19 year old would, which is a very turbulent time to be, uh, to discuss anyways. But that loss of identity led me down a path of uh, soul searching rather and uh, and that's really what got me into sort of fitness and got me into training, right? Because really, when I look at this, I was uh, I was never really a great, talented wrestler in my life. I I worked really hard and I tried to outwork competitors, very Dan Gable esque. But I thought, well, if I'm not good enough to beat them on the wrestling mat, right, via just talent alone, why well, can at least guarantee that nobody was going to outwork me? So I lend myself to being in a weight room, being in a gym and trying to cross train to prepare for that sport. And when wrestling no longer existed for me, at least uh, competitively, I doubled down on training and really got interested into that aspect. So I started reading more and more programs. I started to explore more and more texts and books and different methodologies of training and then you couple that with the fact that uh, I was a collegiate athlete and I was exposed to strength and conditioning. And that's where sort of my passion began. And I didn't even really know it because uh, which led me to what is otherwise my second big failure, which was I was still a young, naive college freshman. And not only did I lose the identity of being a collegiate athlete, Two years later, as I was going down this road, I essentially was chasing a business degree that I never really felt was what I wanted, right? So I did it and I did it for external circumstances to appease others or whatever. And uh, and it wasn't really a decision that I thought of for me. And then I had a very, very powerful conversation that I will never forget. And I really sort of realize that rather than chasing a stigma or what I thought others might have wanted me to have, having this conversation, I chose what I wanted to pursue, which was strength and conditioning, right? I was reading all these books um, on fitness and training and all this. And, you know, I was avoiding the books on uh, microeconomics and macroeconomics and, and studying personal finance and accounting and all this. And it was clear as day. I mean, it was right under my nose that I should have just realized that where my passion lied was strength and conditioning. And that's when I changed my degree to kinesiology. I doubled down my efforts academically and stayed uh, throughout summers and, and literally was being as, uh, as attentive to my kinesiology and academic studies as I possibly could. And that is where I chased my degree and, and ultimately began an internship and chased that and was fortunate enough to have a college strength and conditioning coach, uh, Red Wakeham at Michigan State, who took a chance on me and gave me an opportunity to try to cut my teeth and learn about college strength and conditioning. And, 
and remains a great mentor and a great friend today. And then I was fortunate enough to get a graduate assistantship and the story goes on and on and on, right? But two otherwise very obvious failures that were rattling to me um, when I was told I wasn't essentially smart enough or didn't have the grades to go to a business school. And then secondly, that uh, when I lost that identity of being a student athlete, but honestly, without both of those things, I don't think I would be where I'm at right now. Another question that I love to ask is, what advice would you give to a smart, driven college student about to enter the real world? Well, I deal with smart, driven college student athletes all the time. I also deal with college age graduate assistants and interns that are applying for their first uh, entry level strength conditioning position all the time. And what I would say is that it is infinitely easier to give advice than to take it. So uh, with that said, I, uh, I often offer quite a bit of advice. Well, what I would offer is this, when you have the option to, and everybody's life circumstances are different, travel, go around, meet other coaches, interact, network, build relationships, visit other sites, learn other philosophies, learn other principles, try to find people that disagree with you, and then try to wrap your head why they may be in a position where they disagree with whatever your thought beliefs are. I think the more that you do this, the more that you visit other places, hear about other philosophies that are different to your own, very similar to the Bruce Lee quote, you can then absorb what is useful, discard what is useless, and then add what is specifically your own. But if you don't do that and you're not exposed to those other methodologies or philosophies, then I think uh, you're, you're missing out on a large portion of continuing education. Another question I love is, what are some bad recommendations you hear in the profession or in the area of this expertise? Well, I do have an opinion on that. And my friend Brett Bartholomew has spoke about this on many other podcasts, but uh, I'll shed some light to it as well. We are an industry that seems to want to glorify the fact that we work 20 hours in a given day. Right, That if you're not on the floor coaching uh, for those 20 hours, that you're not a coach. And as a consequence of this, right, we see many, many coaches that are either in poor health, that are facing burnout, that have lost friends, that have lost loved ones, that have lost family members because they put the job first. And by no means of disrespect to our industry or to our profession, right? This is a service-based business, and you must provide high-quality service to the student-athletes and those that you work with. However, you also need to take care of your own health and your own relationships and your own family. So one of the advice that I hear uh, given to people all the time is whether it's being the first in and last out which I admire that. Don't get me wrong. I think you need to pay your dues. You need to grind. You need to do whatever it is in the first part of your career. And hell, maybe even into the the later parts of your career, right? Be willing to do what it takes to get the job done. But the glorification of just spending time in the weight room to be the first one in or to be the last one out when you have no real reason to be there is a hallmark of misaligned priorities, especially if you have other places and other teams that you're a part of, i.e. your community, your church, your religion, your family, whoever, right? Whatever part, whatever additional team that you're a part of, you owe it to be a great team member, a great team leader to those areas of your life. So these uh, the athletes that I service, absolutely, they are a part of our family, both my wife and myself and my children, they're a part of our family. But in addition to that, we also have our own personal intimate family. And uh, and a lot of times I hear so many coaches talk about having better relationships with the athletes that they service than their own wives, their own husbands, their own children. And uh, above all, I think you do need to cultivate and you need to have those relationships 
with your family members. So if you don't have business or work to do in the weight room, then why are you coming in at 6 a.m. in the morning? If it's just to be there, that is terrible advice. The next question I'll ask myself is, what are some of the resources that helped you become more proficient in strength and conditioning and coaching? Well, I don't even know where to start with this question. Um, I've made it a habit in my life to compile resources, right? Whether books, audio, videos, uh, conversations with other coaches. So if I were to try to stand in front of you and say that I'm a self-made strength and conditioning coach, a self-made man, that would be a complete lie. I stand on the shoulders of giants. I know it's cliche to say, but it's it's true. I have uh, I am the person I am because of the books that I've read and the resources I've consumed. Um, so I don't know. I mean, that's a that's a very challenging question. So obviously, I had mentors in my life, uh, both at Michigan State University and elsewhere along my coaching journey. And and like I said earlier, it's a little bit like that Bruce Lee quote. I've absorbed what is useful uh, from the coaches and from the books and from the resources that I've read. I've discarded what I can't use, what I I deem useless. And there's some things that other coaches might prioritize and say, this is the holy grail where I've looked at and said, I don't know, maybe not for me, maybe not for my athletes, maybe not for where I'm at in my life. And then maybe thirdly, I've added what is specifically my own, and that is the personality and the inherent traits and characteristics and, and the personality that I bring to the floor. So I think it is a hallmark of self-realization. It's a hallmark of knowing yourself, who you are, who you're not, what your strengths, what your weaknesses are, uh, hiring people around you to complement uh, or check what are your weaknesses, and then really put a spotlight on the things that you do incredibly well um, and put those on in the forefront. So resources, books, I borrow from business, I borrow from personal development. Obviously, I've read the strength and conditioning classics. I'm a big fan of using online resources, continuing education, uh, membership sites. I've done a number of those like strengthcoach.com, uh, strength coach webinars, uh, even the the new one, which is you know what I've talked about earlier on in the intro of the show, the CVASPS. Uh, community, which is a phenomenal new continuing education resource. So there is, it's a world of continuing education out there. The problem is there's a lot of noise and not a lot of signal. So uh, rather than being maybe a pioneer to one of these continuing education uh, resources, you should be a settler. You should wait, you should sort of test the waters. And then when you see what has some traction, then sort of settle uh, with that continuing education resource. But books, audios, videos, I think if you have the uh, accessibility, which we do, right? This is the the thing that I've, I stole from Kelly Starrett in one of his videos is that nowhere in the course of history do we have the greatest access to high-quality, world-class coaches at our fingertips like we do now, right? With Twitter, with Instagram, with online connectivity and high-speed internet, we can literally Skype call with some of the world's greatest coaches in an instant. And we didn't have that 30 years ago, right? If you wanted to learn about Olympic Olympic weightlifting and you were in Des Moines, Iowa, well, I'm sorry, you'd have to you know, hop on a bus, drive a car, and find an Olympic weightlifting coach in a different city or in that city. Now you log on, you go to Google, you search your community, and you search whatever topic that you're looking for, and you can have instant uh, accessibility to high-quality coaches. Another question uh, I ask my guests all the time is, uh, what is an unusual habit or an absurd thing that you love? (laughs) Well, where do I begin? Um... We have these online personas, right, of what you think a person is all about. But when you sit down and you actually break bread with a coach or another person or whatever industry, 
you start to realize that whatever persona one might have on the internet or whatever their faceplate might be, uh, there's a lot of nuances. There's a lot of personalities that you you just don't get to pick up on because you don't get to see that aspect in 140 characters. So I don't know. There's a there's a lot of different things uh, that might make me uniquely me. Um, I love the fact and I admire this of people that have a very sort of stoic property to their sort of demeanor. Um, I, I look at coaches like Mark D'Antonio, who's obviously a Michigan State head football coach and admire his level of steadfast and stoicism in his coaching abilities. And I, I, I hope to someday emulate that. And that is sort of maybe characteristic of a strong mind or of a ease of mind, perhaps. Um, and that is something I'm consistently trying to improve and work on through meditation and mindfulness training. Um, I'm a big connoisseur of movies and music, uh, movies, and shows, whether it's uh, Game of Thrones or our beloved Breaking Bad. I mean, there's a number of different things that go into absurd uh, habits or things that I love. I'm a big connoisseur of different teas, whether it's your mamate, which isn't really a tea, green teas. I love to experiment with them. I love the smell. Um, although I'm not the biggest fan of the flavors without a little bit of lemon flavoring. So that is something I'm trying to become more of a connoisseur of because I do love the ritual of making tea, of sitting down for tea. Um, it's just that I I don't necessarily like the flavor, which is, you know, a large part of uh, of consuming tea. So that's sort of absurd. As I get closer towards the end of the show, uh, some of the questions that I start to wrap up the show is, is that in the last five years, let's say, maybe three to five years, what have you become better at saying no to, whether it's distractions or invitations or et cetera? And if so, what are some new realizations or approaches that have helped you or tips that have helped you um, decline invitations, which sort of seems bizarre. Why would you want to uh, decline any invitation? Well, one of the people that I borrow a lot of resources and, and sort of thoughts from is Derek Sivers. And he's been on a number of different podcasts, not a strength and conditioning coach, uh, an entrepreneur, actually a uh, the founder and CEO of CD Baby, went on to uh, make millions and millions of dollars and uh, and now is living the good life. But nonetheless, he has a very interesting personal philosophy. And one of the things that he accredits that philosophy to, or his sort of where he got in his life, is the fact that he literally just said yes to everything. Like, do you want to do this gig? Yes. Do you want to play it for $5? Yes. Uh, do you want to go and and do this side gig? Absolutely. Credits it, just his willingness to say yes to anything and everything. Well, what challenging is i think sometimes especially when when you do that for a while and i was probably certainly the same way yes 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 to everything in my life that uh you begin to very quickly deprioritize yourself and maybe people around you and i think as you have more responsibilities and things you need to do you need to be very strategic about what you do what are high sort of reward or high return activities and what are low um, ROIs or return on that investment activities as well. So, you know, there will be times where it'd be great. Hey, could you come out? Could you do the speaking engagement? Could you come do this or do that? And really what I try to do is weigh it in sort of the ideology of when I'm thinking about it, I understand that my time is limited and and time is something that you can absolutely not get back, right? Money, financial gains, uh, whatever, whatever it might be, professional gains or losses, whatever, right? You can make that up. You can lose you, whatever. But time is something that absolutely, no matter how rich or how poor, what your status is, you'll never be able to get that time back. So, you know, a lot of the times I think of, uh, I think of this, 
I read a lot of Stoic philosophy, and one of my favorite sort of authors were Marcus Aurelius and his private wartime journals. And what I really love in in one of his writings was the idea of what is otherwise memento mori, which is a philosophy or at least a thought that uh, you could leave life right now. The very breath that you're taking could be your very last breath ever. And I know it's sort of morbid to think about, but if that were the case, what would you want to be doing? And a lot of the times it would either be, I want to be doing my best work, or I would want to be surrounded by my loved ones, my children, my wife, my family. And that is sort of maybe the philosophy that I try to carry is that I want to make sure that the time that I have on earth, the time that I have is spent doing what uh, what is otherwise high return activities. And a lot of times it's it's being surrounded by the ones that I love. My last question that I will wrap up most shows with is just that when you feel overwhelmed or unfocused, what are some of the activities or what have you done to help regain that focus? For me, it's a number of different things, right? And uh, I might have talked about it on other shows and it might be... I don't know, maybe I'm I'm overkill with this topic, but whenever I feel incredibly overwhelmed, I do a number of things and the strategies just sort of uh, determined are determined by maybe the time allocations that I have. A lot of the times, I think most of our strength conditioning coaches maybe got into this industry, right? We escaped to the weight room for uh, a release in some respects. So the weight room and physical activity is a huge sort of proponent of uh, or a huge release for me when I start to feel unfocused in my daily life or in my work life. Returning to the weight room and returning to what is otherwise physical labor can be something that sort of centers me. It's almost like a little bit of a physical uh, meditation for me, if you will. I think the second thing that I, I do often is that when I do have the time and I carve out the time, I allocate and make this time, that going through some guided meditation, sitting down, whether it's in a lit room, dark room, a quiet place, and actually going through whether it's otherwise like guided meditation via headspace or elsewhere, that can help sort of restore my clarity and my calm and my focus on what I need to do. And then the third thing is whether it's you utilizing a bullet journal or the best self journal, I do a little bit of writing and uh, and the, the strategies I've taken away and there's a phenomenal uh, product out there called the five minute journal. And it talks about, it essentially guides you through a number of different things like it, it, uh, you write down in the morning, you write down in the evening, a few different things. And some of the things are is like, what are you grateful for? So gratitude journaling, if you will, right? So a lot of the times it's taking stock in the things that you already own and already have like, hey, you know what? I'm really, really grateful for the fact that my children are healthy. My wife is healthy. I have a profession and a job that I love to do. And I'm surrounded by great high quality professionals that are all interested in doing the same thing, right? Supporting our student athletes and winning championships. And that is just a good piece in the morning to sort of say, hey, you know what? Things are okay, right? Like you know, as you wake up, it could be a lot worse, right? There are some some easy wins in the, in the beginning of your day that you can be grateful for to help sort of guide your mind on the right, on the right path. And again, at the end of the day, you start talking about journaling, writing down wins that you had during the day. Like what, what were some little wins? Well, I did that 60 minute workout or I accomplished this goal that I wanted to do at work, or I sat down and, and meditated for 10 minutes or whatever it might be, right? Like you're just journaling, you're writing these things down and you start to have a little bit of a moment of reflection of what happened during the, during the day. And then you can sort of coach yourself, right? You're sitting there and you're thinking, okay, what can I do better tomorrow? So you're starting to align what you did in reflection with ways of improvement. 
And this journaling every night, while it takes three to five minutes for me, has been a powerful thing to help me understand where and when I'm utilizing my time wisely, where and when I'm not, and help aligning myself under those high strategic, high return on investment activities that will help continue to hopefully lead me down a pathway of good fortune and my best work. Hey, everybody, that's going to be this edition of the Decoding Excellence Show mini episode starring me, uh, which is sort of random. But if you like these sort of self-driven monologues, hit me up on Twitter. It is at Adam Ringler, or you could go to decodingexcellence.com or adamringler.com and leave me a note. Let me know what you want from these mini episodes and and we'll curtail this show to what is otherwise maybe some of the questions that the audience might have. If there's something I can do to provide you a little bit more clarity or drive the conversation in a different fashion, I would love to do it for you. You guys are my muse. You guys are what I uh, I cater to. This is a show with is which is sort of an interest only to you guys. And uh, I want to make sure that the show reflects that. So If there's anything I can do for the audience, please let me know. I would love to help drive the conversation towards that direction and help provide some answers or at least maybe (laughs) ask them some more confusing questions that might make you think a little bit because that's the nature of the show. We want to think. We want to start to decode and better understand what goes into excellence performance. And that takes a lot of reflection. So Thank you guys again so much. I I look forward so much to having some great uh, participants and guests coming on the Decoding Excellence show here soon. So keep your eyes out on new episodes. And until then, thank you.